Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Chautauqua, where the audience is always part of the show and where history comes alive. And why does it come alive? Because history is too interesting to just stay in a book. And so we are here tonight to meet a contributor whose face has been not seen by our audiences for 25 years now, though he's played an important part in all of our shows. In fact, with one of the flyers from this year, you'll see his work displayed as you have for years past, and we're going to find out about that tonight. Now, a few words for our audiences as people are continuing to get logged on. For best viewing, we recommend you watch tonight's program in speaker view. You can change your view settings by clicking the view icon, which is typically located at the top right corner of your screen. As always with Chautauqua, there will be questions. The interactive nature of it is one of the important things that I really cherish in our Chautauqua programs. So you can send your questions for tonight's speaker via the chat box to Kristen Bennett or Charity Rouse with the Spartanburg County Library. Uh, you simply go to the, depending on which kind of computer you're using to the bottom or to the top. I know on my iPad, there's a series of dots at the top and you touch them and it allows you access to the chat room, the chat box. The chat box is usually located along the bottom or along the top of your screen and Charity and Kristen will monitor the chat throughout the program and then will share questions uh, with me towards the end so that I can uh, relay the questions to the audience and to our guest for this evening. Uh, the program is being recorded. So for those of you who've logged on, I think you're all getting that message that the program is being recorded and it will be available to view on the Spartanburg County Public Library's YouTube channel for two weeks. So if you have friends that said, oh, I forgot that was happening tonight, and they would like to see our interview here from our guest speaker, then they can log on through the YouTube channel for Spartanburg County Library. Uh, an email will be sent out to all the registrants once the recording is available live. Please note that it usually does take a few uh, days for the videos to get posted. So don't expect it first thing tomorrow. It'll be a couple of days, but then you'll have access. We have lots of fun things coming up at both the Spartanburg County Library, which is undergoing some amazing changes at this moment as well, and the Greenville Chautauqua, which is preparing in just two weeks for the show that we're gonna be talking a bit about this evening. Uh, for additional information about library programming, you can visit the, uh, the Spartanburg County Library events calendar at www.spartanburglibraries.org. And to stay up to date on the latest Greenville Chautauqua news, you can visit our website and join our mailing list at www.historycomesalive.org. So with that bit of housekeeping underway, Let's get started with the main feature of our show tonight, which is a discussion with Tom Chalkley in Baltimore, Maryland. I am sitting in my library here in Greer, South Carolina. It's amazing technology zooming all over the world. Um, and, and I uh, uh, will be representing us tonight uh, in the festival as Robert Ripley, not tonight I won't be Robert Ripley, but during the festival I'll be performing as Robert Ripley, who of course also was an artist. And I'm very curious if the, the background of Ripley the artist in any way parallel the background of Ch Tom Ch uh, Chalkley as an audience. So Tom, uh, uh, welcome to the Greenville Chautauqua. And I just wanted to ask Robert Ripley, was noted by all his childhood uh, peers as a fellow who was constantly drawing. His, his notebooks were probably more full of sketches than they were full of schoolwork. Um, I just wondered, did you have a similar start? How did you get started as an artist? What, uh, do you hear me loud and clear? I hear you loud and clear. Okay, good. Um, 
I got started pretty much because it was it, it was in my genes. My family is full of full of artists. And when I was a little boy, I think the earliest drawing I've seen, I was four. And it was just a crayon picture of a cowboy who was mostly made up of circles, uh, you know, ovals. I just drew everything in little ovals, which is not not bad for a beginner. Uh, but I, uh, yeah, I always was a little artist boy. And, um, and I was interested in science, but by the time I was in junior high school, I realized I wasn't good enough at math to be a scientist. So, uh, and then it was right on time to just become a young, crazy surrealist because I was 15 years old, you know. And eventually I got into political cartooning and at the same time into uh, just what I consider kind of, I don't want to say utility art, but it's, it's, I do a lot of art for a purpose. Um, some, some edifying purpose or other. And uh, I've been doing that pretty much full time since the mid 90s when I became a, a father and I started staying home with kids and drawing full time. I, I, I do have one little thing. Uh, your microphone might be brushing against uh -oh. your beard. You might want to pull it a little away from you because we're getting a little distortion there. And I think it's just a microphone head is maybe brushing Brush. against you. So that'll that'll probably fix it right up. I, another thing, uh, that could. Um, so the, Robert Ripley also uh, was not a trained artist. When he first got printed in a national magazine and then when he first started working for newspapers in San Francisco, uh, he had had no formal training whatsoever. Uh, uh, though he did decide he needed to go early morning and take classes when he became more and more professional to, to make sure he could do it correctly, would do it well or better. Uh, what about you? Did you have any kind of formal training in art? Well, uh, we, I had uh, the, the public schools. I'm going to shout out to the public schools that we need art programs. But the, I had good public school uh, art education, I would say, exposed me to a lot of different things. Um, as a child, when I was like eight, eight nine years old, I uh, had some lessons with uh, an elderly lady who lived in my hometown, Kensington, Maryland. And uh, she was just a, somebody my mother knew at church who was a painter. And um, so she gave me and my brother lessons, some other kids. And then I went to community college in Rockville, Maryland for a year and a half, got sick. Uh, physically dropped out and I never went back. So from then on, from that, I had a year and a half of like college, but uh, I basically trained myself after that to, to do illustration and cartooning. So after that point, it was self-teaching. I know that Robert Ripley often studied the work of others and, and learned some of his style that he developed by simply imitating other artists and saying, oh, I can use this particular technique or that particular technique and then blending it into something of his own. Is that something of the course you follow? Oh, absolutely. You know, they're illustr I grew up, we're the generation that read Mad Magazine. So they were, uh, the Mad Magazine artists were a big influence on me. Um, people who read, read the comics of our generation would remember Pogo by Walt Kelly. Uh, Walt Kelly was a big influence. In my adolescence, I uh, got into the underground comics. Robert Crumb, though, in particular, a genius draftsman. And then I had uh, heroes among um, political cartoonists and caricaturists. So Patrick Oliphant. Um, I'm a big fan of Patrick Oliphant. I was a big fan of David Levine, who used to do the uh, caricatures in the New York Review of Books. Uh, he did he did the literary, he did a lot of Chautauqua style, uh, you know, this sort of thing where he was illustrating book reviews, but they were all the great writers and so forth. And so I admired that. And I wanted to, I, I, I like getting a chance to do things that are historical or literary in, in uh, subject matter. So that's just, Nate, it worked out for me nicely. Uh, I know that you have been drawing cartoons since our very first Greenville Chautauqua 25 years ago. This is our 25th season. 
but I believe a little before that, you were already drawing carto- the, the, the caricatures for other Chautauquas, even prior to ours. Um, could you tell us about your early experience of, in, in getting into the Chautauqua character drawing profession? I do not know who particularly uh, got in touch with me, but it was the Maryland Humanities Council, which is now just known as Maryland Humanities. They, and this had to be around 1995 or 96, because I can remember at the time visiting their office with uh, a two-year-old. I think I'd actually been doing it from about 1993, because the, uh, the two-year-old was born in, um, she was born in 95, and I was already doing them, I believe, when she was born. And uh, so that was more like 30 years ago that I would have first taken it up with uh, Maryland Humanities. And uh, I, I don't know if they're, I don't know if they started their series up again since COVID, but I haven't heard from them. Well, I know that our own founder, George Frein, was working with the, uh, the, the Great Plains Chautauqua in the Dakotas. And uh, I think he saw your work with the Maryland Humanities and then invited you to do work for them so that when George moved to Greenville, oh, yeah. uh, he, he brought knowledge of you and your work here. And uh, I believe he called you early on from here to start doing the cartoons that we use. Uh, I, there's there's a great story I want to share with you about this, and I heard this from George, uh, and I've heard this from others as well. That uh, at one point there was a move to perhaps uh, change some of our advertising to sort of after you know after 20 years you want to sort of modernize and and go with the times and make things as accessible to people as possible. So uh, we sought out the advice of some advertising agencies about uh, things that could be changed to make us more relevant, more inviting, to help improve our audience. And, um, and one of the things they talked about is, are the caricatures like old fashioned? Is this something that we should replace with something else? And the advertising, uh, uh, the free advice from the advertisers was no, the caricatures are the best thing about the advertising for the Greenville Chautauqua. The caricatures really set the tone, set the mood. They, they are, they really sell the program. And if there's anything that doesn't get changed, it would be the Tom Chalkley caricature. So I thought that was a big vote of confidence for you. That's very sweet. That's the first I've heard that. Well, thanks for sharing me, sharing that with me rather. Sure. Well, let's talk a little bit about our upcoming season, which, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, June the 9th is starting in just about two weeks. Um, Up on the screen, uh, we have a composite of the five characters that will be represented this year at the uh, uh, Greenville Chautauqua. Could you tell us about your composition and talk a bit, if you would, about uh, developing the caricatures? Okay, great. Um, This, which we've seen up on the screen uh, for a while now, this is what we always, I refer to them as the ensemble. Uh, Greenville gives me, I think we've done four, five, maybe even six, I think a couple of times, characters to develop. And I begin, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have any of my scribbles, you know, just pencil scribbles. But one of the first things I do nowadays is think about how am I gonna posture these people so that in the end, I will be able to fit them together in, a, in an ensemble and they won't just look like one from column A and one from column B. So they're just kind of basic housekeeping kind of things. If you look at these, all their heads are about the same size uh, I, and their bodies with proportion, You know, I think it works out to their bodies if they were all to stand up, their bodies would be slightly taller than their heads. So I just kind of have these, that's just, that's kind of the infrastructure. But as I was thinking about these characters, some of them are inside, some of them are outside, they can't really be in a common space. 
I did do one for Greenville once where we had immigrant stories and all of them were immigrants and I had them on a dock coming away from the ships. So that was, you know, that was a natural way to combine them. In this case, what I did to try to give them some kind of unity, I was thinking about which way are they facing and I put Steve Jobs in the middle because nobody's ever seen a side view of Steve Jobs, I think. <laughs> um, he's always looking at the camera. But I also thought, of, and this is for the artists out there, they'll appreciate this. I was all think, also thinking, these are black and white. And increasingly, I like to think I've got to, you know, for them to punch and pop out, I should have some areas of solid black. So if you look at them, they each have an area, again, a, 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 some interesting shapes of solid black. So this is all just art shop talk, I suppose. But these are the kinds of things I think about. How are these folks going to interact? Is one, is one figure going to wash out the others because it's so much more interesting than the others? You want to kind of balance uh, those elements. Um, do you want to start looking at the characters chronologically, I think you said? Yeah, let's start with uh, James Armistead Lafayette, the, uh, the spy uh, who helped to win the Revolutionary War. Okay, hold on a second. It's, it's, I've got to move my screen a little bit. Okay, there he is. All right, um, this is an interesting character because A, I'd never heard of him. It's a nice example of the, uh, the secret of black history in this country. I'd never heard of this guy. The other thing that's interesting about it to me is that there's only this one image of him on the left. And fortunately, he's got a great face. You can tell that's a real portrait. They weren't just making up a guy. And if we look at him, I don't know how well people at, in our studio audience can see this, but he's I mean, he's got a very rumpled face. This is an older man. He's got gray hair. That's his natural hair. He's um, got a receding hairline and gray hair. So he's a little older. This would have been after the revolution that he had his portrait done. So I tried to draw, come up with a younger looking man, same guy. And I, I love the way his, look at in this original portrait, his eyes are looking off to the side. I don't know if you can see that. Maybe you can enlarge that for yeah. you. But his eyes, let me see. I got my tools off the screen here, so I'm just going to have to go find some tools. I'll take my word for it rather than mess with the artwork here. Um, I may be able to just zoom in a little bit. Here, let's try this. Oh, here we go. Sorry. There we go. Can you see him a little bit better? Yes. His eyes, he's got rather light eyes and they're looking off to one side. So he's, he looks surreptitious. He looks, he's a spy. So it's a great way to use this kind of concerned, apprehensive look and just lift it right into the drawing. And I concentrated, as you can see, I concentrated on that fierce expression around the eyes. I made him a little younger, so he doesn't, he's not quite as wrinkly up there. And then uh, I wanted to pose him in a situation where he's um, in the act of spying, right? How do you show that? I'll, I'll realize I have my, these grid lines. We don't want those, there we go. I, I tend not to even know that, notice them until I notice them. Let me zoom out again. So anyway, I made this guy a younger man. I have him sort of tiptoeing and then my solid black area is these two British soldiers. And apparently, I think part of the story here is that he was a, a spy for the Americans of the British. The British thought he was spying for them. And he yes. would feed the British, he feed them phony stories about what the Americans were doing. And then he'd go on spying on them. So he had to be nervy. He had to be capable of almost becoming invisible, you know, being underestimated. And there are other characters in, the, I think one year we did Robert Smalls. Right. The uh, black, sea, black pilot 
who stole a ship from the Confederacy because, you know, he was able to do it because they underestimated him. They said, oh, we'll leave Robert in charge of the ship while we go drink on shore. And the joke was on them. I thought, think that's lovely. Anyway, you can see a couple of the things that I work on. I look at the expression, obviously. I look at the shapes of the features. I look at the shape of the face, and he's got a very craggy face. And I exaggerated a little bit of the cragginess, partly to emphasize that wide, grim mouth of his. So you make decisions when you're drawing caricatures about what's, what's important, what's definitive, what's large and small. Um, let's see, next, historically speaking, would be Mary Shelley. Mary Shelley. And Mary Shelley is, I think, my favorite from this set. These were all fun faces to do. <clears throat> but Mary Shelley has this very um, pure, slender, egg-shaped face. Now, I did have one other portrait of her to go from. And I think I used the hair. The hairstyle was more from that other portrait. But you can see what, it, what's, what you would all pick this out. You'd say, well, she's got that long, thin nose, her very round forehead. Her, her mouth is rather small and demure. Sometimes you make things smaller. If there's, it's a small mouth, you can make it smaller. But what I noticed about her, at, at smaller at smaller sizes, she almost looks like she's wearing spectacles, like she's wearing little glasses here, but it's just she's got this very strong eyelid and the circular uh, crease under her eyes. So at a smaller size, she almost looks like she's wearing granny glasses, but it's an illusion. But I picked up on that. You can see I've got the little crease under her eyes and the arch of her eyes, eyelids. Now, she had a tough life. She had a tempestuous life, we could say, <clears throat> and um, was raised by anarchist parents. That must have been interesting. And um, fell in love with Shelley at a very, at, with Percy Shelley, of all people, at a very young age. So anyway, I wanted to draw her as looking haunted uh, by her own experience as much as by, you know, things she made up. So I used this, her big black shape is this shadow. My intention here was to have a sort of amorphous shape that could be just her shadow in the gaslight or a whale oil light or whatever it is, a candle, or it could be something else, you know, it could be something threatening. So I picture her, this is almost the way I think of Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe as this haunted writer at his desk. And uh, I even, didn't even think about this, but I like the tentative pose of her pen over here. Her quill as she's hovering, you know, hesitantly. So I was trying to get a sense of her as being a, a haunted personality. Um, any, okay, we can just keep moving. Who should, uh, okay. Nellie Bly? Nellie Bly. Okay, we're At going the from there. At the end of the 1800s. So we've covered the end of right. the 1700s, the beginning of the 1800s, and now we're on to the end of the 1800s. Here's another person. Now, I knew the name Nellie Bly, but I knew it from folklore because the name Nellie Bly turns up in some versions of the Ballad of Frankie and Johnny. Your man was here last night with a gal named Nellie Bly. So I think it's kind of a folklore kind of name. And it wasn't her real name. It's her pseudonym. So she chose that name to convey something, maybe a daring do or a naughtiness on her part. I never really knew there was a real person named Nellie Bly until I got this assignment. Thank you very much. You're uh, welcome. One thing, she's clearly, she looks very young and in, in this photograph and very striking those eyes could you lie to her she'd see right through you so i think you know she and she became kind of the icon of the plucky girl reporter i read a lot about her after this and she was quite a dresser she loved big hats i didn't give her one 
she kept this kind of girlish quality. I, there are pictures of her at an older age than this, and she's still got this kind of saucy, um, smart uh, quality about her. Um, here she looks so young. I got to get rid of the stupid grid again. It's for some reason that's the default. That's better. Um, but she has a sort of a, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a side view of her, but she has a, a sort of a turned up little round nose. It's a challenge drawing somebody who doesn't have a lot of wrinkles to, fortunately she does have really distinct features, those big um, clear eyes, the turned up nose, and she had a rather strong willful chin. So those were all things I used. And in terms of the setting here, well, her big interesting black shape is that window, broken. And I think the portrayer wondered what all this stuff symbolized. Well, it didn't symbolize anything except her ability to go behind the scenes and to go perhaps where she, a lady didn't go, her ability to, to you know, walk through open doors and ask hard questions. And in this case, I have her muckraking, spying in. And, uh, I, she investigated. She was an investigative journalist. And something of it, she was a celebrity journalist at a time when that was not a popular vocation. There were journalists. There were very few celebrity journalists. Like Mark Twain was one. And I'm sure there were a couple others, but Nellie Bly was the only other. Um, darn it, my name, I'm, I'm losing her, but there was a, 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 a black woman at this contemporary with her, Ida May. Um, you know who I'm talking about? It was a, um, I'm blanking, uh, who's a black journalist woman who was also, she was plucky and ferocious and and uh, took on challenges like this. So anyway, yeah, the uh, 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 un unusual brave woman here. Right. And then I guess we go on to the beginning of the 20th century and we have Robert Ripley. Now here's a fellow who, um, he's one of these caricatures that kind of draws itself. Let me get rid of the grid again here. And well, he's got two, he's got three things and, and they're all, all useful to the caricaturists. He had the, those kind of little squinty triangular eyes, uh, that long kind of elaborate nose, a lot, of, a lot of bony action in his nose. And I just pulled that out a little bit to where it overlaps his mouth, but his mouth is fantastic. Um, he had those enormous teeth. I wonder if they were real. Well, they were, and they were buck teeth that he had had. If you see a picture of him as a yeah. child, they are just as big, but in a much smaller mouth. Wow. Yeah. So well, that he, was, it, it caused him, he, he, he later stated that he was amazed that he became a radio celebrity because the, the teeth caused him to have speaking problems, which resulted in nervousness and stuttering. Oh. And uh, he had to overcome that and to be for 20 years or more, one of the major radio personalities, even he couldn't believe it. I did not know he was on radio. I just knew him. Oh, as a, huge, uh, huge show. Goodness. Radio and the movies and even in television. So he was a good storyteller. Right. Yeah, because uh, you can't show cartoons on radio. Mm -hmm. I've, I've tried. Um <laughs> Anyway, in his case, the dark, the dark, interesting shape is the backdrop of the of the, the dark jungle forest. And what I did, and there is a picture of him wearing the pith helmet, you know, the Mr. Explorer hat there. Um, I had to put him as a drawing easel. I have an easel like this, so I used my easel, um, portable easel. But he needed to have several images that were Ripley esque. And I boiled it down to these three, the Balinese demon character, because a lot of the pictures available of him, he has these Balinese masks 
in them. Uh, the two-headed baby skeleton, kind of the sideshow side of Robert Ripley. And there, he definitely had a, a sideshow quality to what he put out there. Um, you know, he just have you know, he just have a picture, two-headed baby skeleton on the such and so museum. And then the he, um, he also I'll mention, I'm interrupt you to just to mention that he also opened a series of actual museums where things like the two-headed child, things like stuffed animals and live human curiosities were on display in his museums, and his museums continue to this very day. There's one in Baltimore. There's what I've never been in there, but there is a Ripley Mysteriology Museum or whatever they, at the Inner Harbor, and it's practically the, the only thing down there. The auditorium. Auditor the auditorium. Yeah. Um, and I should just mention that the animal is a platypus, and I, I put it in there because it said what, because he did do animals. He'd say this amazing creature does such and so. I remember saying the wildebeest has the head of an ox, the body of a horse, the tail, you know, and it was kind of some of it was folklore. But uh, the platypus is about as Ripley-esque an animal as I could think of. I, I do have one story about one of his, and I think this ties in with our conversation tonight. Um, he also would publish pictures sent in with stories from his readers. One of his major sources were literally hundreds of thousands of believe it or not, so that were sent to him by his readers. And one of them was sent in by a little boy named Charlie about his pet dog. It was a beagle that loved to eat little bits of metal. And the boy had sketched a picture and uh, he ran the picture and said, this belongs to so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, he eats and he described the metal that he ate. And uh, the little boy whose picture was run by Ripley on his believe it or not column later went on to become a cartoonist himself by the name of Charles Schultz. Mm -hmm. And the dog that ate the metal was the model for Snoopy from the Peanuts cartoons, first appearing in Ripley's Believe It or Not. Believe It or Not. A boy of Destiny. That's amazing. I never had, never heard that. No. Wow. Um, Anyway, we're ripping through the, I'm just trying to think if there's anything much more to say here. Uh, no, we can, we, we can move along, eh? Sure. So the last one, I got my mouse to go where it needs to go. There we go. Steve Jobs. It's interesting. Um, people who saw me working on this immediately, people latch onto the contemporary figure, I guess, Steve Jobs. Now, there's a, you might notice is uh, not, not a perfect match between the Steve Jobs in the photo that I salvaged and the Steve Jobs here. And what I'll do sometimes with characters, uh, this is Steve Jobs toward the end of his life. He was born the same year I was. And I looked at not just those pictures, but I looked at lots of pictures of him younger um and kind of tried to hit something somewhere in the middle so he's not quite as grandfatherly looking as he winds up looking here but i i particularly like the early photographs of steve jobs where he looked like he was a wunderkind you know he was this bright young genius boy and i wanted to capture some of that bravado um but i think if i were to if i were to draw him at this stage in his life I would have exaggerated that, you know, he's got more of that older man bulge to the bottom of his face, et cetera. But I, I don't know. I think this is not the strongest of the set, but it does. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's definitely Steve Jobs. And if you didn't notice, he has this. Uh, his big black interesting shape is the screen, of course. Um, anyway, so that, and, and he's got his shirt. So I tried to like, again, keep the visual interest with, playing with those solid blacks, especially because there's a lot of detail in the other spaces. And sometimes you can, a drawing can get lost in its details. So it's nice to find a way to simplify it. Um, anyway, those are our characters. Right. Uh, and as I said, the show is going to be starting in just two weeks. And I'm sure that with the discussion here, 
our audience is more than ever fascinated to have a chance to hear them speak aloud and in their own words, and then have a chance to ask them questions that you can dig deeper into their histories. But in addition to Chautauqua, now I know you can't be doing just Chautauqua caricatures full time. Uh, I was interested in what other kinds of projects you work on on a regular basis. Uh, well, the key word is regular because there's not so much that's regular. I have one really uh, faithful client in Louisiana. If any of you are ever in Slidell, Louisiana, um, it's a publisher down there who does cartoon maps of all the parishes. They're commercial. He's, he uh, sells space on the maps. And I do caricatures of all these small business people all over Louisiana with their little signs and their little shops. Hundreds of them. I've done hundreds because I've been working for him since 2005. Um, I do a tremendous amount, especially this time of year, I do a lot of live caricatures at parties. Um, when COVID came along, that became a, more difficult because at least in the earliest days of COVID, people weren't having parties. And then people figured out how to have Zoom parties. And I got invited to parachute into uh, Zoom parties and draw people at the party. I did hybrid jobs where uh, some people were at the party and some people were just dropping in in the, in the little Zoom corner. And I was able to like sit, invite them into my, what do they call it, a uh, breakout room and have a little one-on-one -on -one and draw the person right on the screen. Uh, I have a, it's over here. I'll tip my board over this little. You can see over here, here's my display gesture. If, if you want to look, you can see I have this great big Wacom tablet that I draw into. And so I just had my computer screen on there and I, people would come on the screen and I'd do them live there. But like the last uh, several, this past week, I've probably drawn, in the past week, I've probably drawn about 100 people uh, live at parties and events. And I'm going to draw more of them tonight for a prom post-prom, and tomorrow night I'm going to do another post-prom at just that time of year. Other than that, I'm doing, I'm doing one project now that I'm rather proud of, even though it's nowhere near finished, and that is a long slideshow about the relationship between climate change and what we do here on the surface of the Earth environmentally, how the destruction of ecosystems uh, worsens the climate problem that's that's a that's a good 40 minute long slideshow in itself wow um do you do all your work in a digital format to begin with or uh, or do you do pen and ink and all that how do you how do you well, usually produce your caricatures that's a very good question I'll, i'm just going to hold up at the camera you know I, I do like pencil pencil drawings i don't know how well you can see that pencil drawings. And the beauty of a pencil drawing is I can like it. Here's, here's one that's a caricature. This is a, a band. These guys are a, a, a band that I know in Baltimore. So I, I'll, I, what I've found works best is to draw the roughs in pencil because I'm more free that way. And I can sit on the back porch and do it. But it's also doesn't feel as permanent somehow. Uh, but then I can just take a snapshot of a pencil drawing, send it to myself and pull it up on my screen over here. So I use that pencil drawing on Photoshop. I put a layer over it, a see-through layer over it, and I can more or less trace my own drawing. It's not really tracing, but it's using it as a guide. That's my normal modus operandi these days. Sometimes I work yes. digitally entirely, but not often. And have you found any particular character that you've done to be harder than the rest? Any that has stood out as being, ooh, it's really hard to capture a certain type of person or a certain person? Um, there are certainly some that are harder than others. I just did a drawing of my, I'm, a, I'm in a small band here. Uh, and we started out as a duo, then we're a trio, and now we're a quartet. The last guy to join the quartet is 
a very handsome guy. He's about 62 years old and he's very, very handsome and he's very, got, got very regular features. That makes somebody hard to draw when they've got really even regular features. So um, most of the historic figures we've had, they've got interesting faces because they're they've lived very full lives they're larger than life personalities and i think some of that comes through in faces so i'm i'm really you know who was difficult to do was martin luther king because partly because he wasn't he was still a young man when he was assassinated he was a pretty young man he did not have a lot of lines on his face he had a fairly smooth face and the fact that he's so dignified and you're drawing a caricature of him. Well, you got to figure out how to convey some of that dignity in the caricature. So there, you see there's a little tension there. It's like dignity on the one hand, caricature on the other, but it's done. He, uh, David, David Levine did it hundreds of times. So, um, but yeah, I would say one of the more challenging people I've ever done was King. Would, would you have a chance to perhaps demonstrate for us uh, the creation of a, of a caricature? Why it just so happens I could. Um, completely spontaneous, this. I'm going to zip, I'm going to turn around to my drawing table and draw here. And because we discussed this ahead of time, I, put, I grabbed myself a couple of faces that I could draw work on for you and we're not going to try to finish these but we are going to try to uh demonstrate process okay so i would like to start with this one can you hear me okay i guess you can right yes okay. yes i can so here's tina turner and i drew her years ago i i did a drawing of her when she looked like this and uh, I think I did it as a, it was a demo piece. Uh, I think I drew it for a website that I did. So anyway, let's take a look at Tina. I like to, I like to gang up a group of pictures to work from. And I knew I wanted to draw her at this point in her life when she just had her big comeback. And I need to find my tools here, tools, tools, tools. Come on down, tools. Okay, where are my tools? There they are. Okay, so here are my Photoshop tools. I'm going to give myself a little fine point to draw with. And there's a particular tool I like. It has a kind of rough pencil-like quality. Now, for I do, when I do my roughs, I like to draw them in a kind of a gray so they seem less permanent to me it's a psychological trick but it's hard to draw black over black i want to have a gray because then i can actually separate the two and erase the grays easily but what do i notice about her right away and i'm looking at a couple of these but she's you know she's got a long slender face but particularly she's got wonderful cheekbones and so that's just if i think about the shape of her face the first thing i'm going to go for is i'm going to try to get those cheekbones in here. See how it's something that's consistent in all these pictures. Let me do this little, little Photoshop for myself here. My computer has a tendency to, to get a little wonky on Photoshop sometimes, so bear with me. We have the beach ball effect going on here, folks. Okay, what I want to do. <clears throat> what I'm, is the beach ball effect? It's just when when the Mac when your Macintosh computer is saying, uh, uh, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait just a minute while I figure out what I'm doing. And the ball spins. The I ball, guess. there it is. And and it, well, if I'm just starting out with Photoshop, it does this a lot. I'm sorry. A spinning beach ball, and they do that to keep you entertained while you're waiting and drumming your your pick your fingers. So anyway, what I'm doing is I'm thinking about the shape of her face, and I'm starting out by, by exaggerating that. I wanted to enlarge this 
this one drawing here a little bit so you can see here. Let me try that again. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. It's gotta be on the right layer. You see how exciting the world of uh, Photoshop can be. As you're working on that, one of our one of our uh, listeners, watchers, has asked about uh, that, that they are interested in doing caricatures for a book they themselves are working on, and wondered your advice in finding someone to do caricatures and drawings for publication. Well, they should look me up. <laughs> How? How Larry. My my business my business name is uh, Graphics by Chalk, Graphics by Chalk as in chalk on a blackboard chalk C H A L K. So I have a website there, at, and that is a, a great way to see what I can do for you. But you know there and 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 if you don't like my style, I got a lot of a lot of other styles. But also there are plenty of caricaturists out there. There's armies of them. Um, but you can get in touch with me individually through my website. Let me, I want to get back to Tina here. That's the end of our commercial announcement. I did not suggest that that person call in and get me to do my commercial there. Um, but thank you. Okay, so here's Tina. My, my wife reminded me that she would be a good subject, especially given given we're we're remembering her now. Now what's going? Oh, the, there we go. Got to get rid of that. Okay, so here I am back with my tool. I'm just thinking about the big cheekbones for starters, but also being a great singer, she has a huge mouth. Now having I've, I've kind of put this framework here and have to fit this huge mouth on this narrow face. But this is this is where the uh, the fun is actually folks. Her her nose is rather fine and delicate. And she's got sort of a I'm looking at this one here. She's got a, a a very distinct sharply defined nose, flaring nostrils. Again, the strong cheekbones here, beautiful teeth. I don't think you can get that kind of te teeth that great just off the off the shelf. My goodness. And yet, and yet, beauty does happen. Look at that. Now, nowadays, you got to be careful because there's an awful lot of eyebrow pencil going around. So you don't really know what people's eyebrows look like, but as a performer she gets her performer eye, eyebrows whatever she whatever she wants and then when she's you notice that when in a couple of these her eyes are practically shut when she's singing and cheering. and most of us our eyes are most of us our eyes do squint up a bit when we're smiling She is stretching her mouth to the max here. That is a singer. Now I get, may get to this point, I might say, well, I want to make her jaw a little longer maybe. And all of this is, this is a digital pencil, but essentially I'm drawing as I would with a pencil. Like I said, a real pencil actually just makes me feel a little more relaxed and free. Now, the easy part, of course, is this incredible hair, which I presume was a wig. I can't believe she really had all that hair. Like Dolly Parton, who's proud of her wig collection. Mm-hmm. Oops, see, there's a little Photoshop artifact. I don't know why they do that sometimes. Now, Tina, I remember drawing her at this period and I gave her that enormous cartoon head, but she's also her her dancing, her body, her uh 
she wore these great short, um, definitely rock and roll dresses. There was one that had a like a raggedy edge to it. And I can't remember, I think she's in her 40s at this stage when she had her big comeback, something like that. And she I remember when, when she met King Charles, well, Prince Charles at the time, now King Charles III. Wow. When they met in a receiving line, Prince Charles commented on her legs as having like the best legs he'd ever seen. Ha <laughs> ha, Charles. What a scamp. What a scamp. Um, but he he uh, should have said, you know, what a dynamic performer you are. Anyway, that's the basic idea. And I would refine this, you know, and you're looking at it, you say, okay, there's the pieces, but do, do I really have something here that, that looks like her to me? And I would say at this stage, I don't yet so much. I had one line there that, that was just wrong. <laughs> that was a that was an early early stab. So you just refine it as you go along. If you want, I've got another uh, I've got another face we could do, real quick. I or, think I think this gives gives the right idea. We want to make right. sure as people send in questions, we have time there. Yeah. Okay. But, let's do that uh, part. Yeah. Uh, also, I wanted to ask you about some of your own contributions to history, because I know that there in the Baltimore area, um, you have been uh, uh, very successful in recording the history of Baltimore. And, and I can recommend to our viewers uh, your book, The History Lover's Guide to Baltimore. Um, but you've done other books as well. You've done The uh, Charmed Life. And maybe you could tell us a bit about your books. And of course, you've done illustrated books as well, which were, you know, I, would, would I be fair to say graphic novels? Um, I've, I've done a lot of work in comics. Uh, I, about 20 years ago, I joined with some other cartoonists and putting out a, just a bunch of Baltimore comics. But my biggest writing efforts have been um well i was i was contributing to a, a weekly here in baltimore for 30 years both as a, an illustrator and a writer and in it was in 2000 we put out this book called charmed life which is a collection of our uh of three writers essays about it was history it was quirky corners of baltimore's story it was quirky characters it was big on quirk um, which is a, an export commodity in Baltimore, but uh, which just, is also which is also something that Robert Ripley would have loved, I am sure. I think I think he would have had some fun here. Uh, I don't know if he ever did, but there definitely was would be things he could have had fun with. Um, the Charmed Life was really quirky stuff. Now the 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 book we published two years ago is pretty much straight history and the the uh, history press is put it, putting out this series a history lovers guide to new york chicago etc baltimore and um my old writing partner brennan jensen seized on the opportunity realized it was probably more than he wanted to chew by himself so he recruited me and we put it pretty much split the writing down the middle and um my only graphic contribution was designing a little a little uh, map of the city to kind of indicate zones of the city in which you'd find this sort of that sort of historical um, content. But basically, it's a book of places, places where you can go and see and touch and experience history directly rather than stand on a street corner and say this is where the Pratt Street riots were, you can go to the train station where the Union troops had to dismount the, from the train and walk to the other train station, prompting the Pratt Street riots at the beginning of the Civil War, that sort of thing. It, instead, we want to take you and show you, here's a place that was there when they got off the troops, uh, got off the, rail, uh, off the train and had to march over to that other train station. So uh, there's a lot of history, but you know we've lost a lot too, like any great city, a lot of stuff has been wiped off the map. 
So the book is a set of essays. Now, my latest adventure as a uh, as a non-professional historian was working with a, uh, another gentleman uh, on researching Frederick Douglass's escape from Baltimore in 1818. Not 18, that was when he was born, 18, uh, 1837. Uh, when he was 18 years old, that's how I made that mistake. He was 18 years old, he escaped from Baltimore. And we developed a theory that he, the escape actually took place not in the heart of the city where the, that rail line began, but rather at a, a depot outside this, just on the edge of town, which was in an industrial area. And the linchpin of this argument was that in those early days, in 1837, the trains left downtown hauled by horses. And then they brought them to this depot on the edge of town and they changed the train over to a locomotive. So if you were escaping from Baltimore, where would you want to get on? At the place it was going to take you two miles drawn by horses, or you want to get on the train and get, make a fast getaway right out of town. So we built the case, I thought rather, rather well. I wrote like a 40 page paper on it. Um, my partner was really the research guy and I did a, a, a certain amount of research, but mostly I was the writer. But it's, it's a fascinating story. I think Fred Douglas is the great Marylander and the, the great, certainly the great Baltimorean in my book. Uh, and uh, his story would make terrific I'm surprised nobody's done a mini series yet because it's great episodes. His life was very episodic. Though, though there are lots and lots of appearances by someone playing Frederick Douglass in a number of wonderful movies. That's yeah. for sure. Yes. By the way, when it comes to your art, who are some of the influences, whether it's in your caricaturing or in your art or in your writing that, that uh, you can recall? Well, uh, Let's talk about caricatures first. I grew up um, in the age of Mad Magazine, in the glory days of Mad Magazine. So uh, Mort Drucker was their great caricaturist. He was the guy who did all the movie and TV satires. Uh, Mort Drucker is one of my heroes. Uh, Walt Kelly, some of your audience probably remembers Pogo from the comics. Walt Kelly always, when I was a little boy even, was my favorite artist. His characters on the page looked like you could pick them up and squeeze them. And he did great political car caricatures in the comic strip, like turning uh, J. Edgar Hoover into a bulldog and, and jo uh, Joseph McCarthy into a, um, a wildcat and so forth. Um, the, in the in my teens, I got uh, in the, under the influence of Robert Crumb and the whole underground comics movement. Um, Crumb particularly just cause the guy can draw. He's about 90 years old now, I think. The guy can just draw. Uh, so he's a hero, but uh, in terms of pure caricature, David Levine, who was the illustrator uh, for the New York Review of Books and sometimes for Esquire magazine and did terrific caricatures of literary figures and then and he was a cross-hatching guy everything was built up with cross-hatching uh on the opposite end of the caricature spectrum there was the great al hirschfeld who did um theater caricatures he was famous mostly for doing caricatures of of uh movie stars and more so theater stars and he had this stripped down minimalistic almost geometric approach to drawing caricatures, which I admire, they're, they're both fantastic, opposite, completely opposite styles of character, Levine on the one hand, Hirschfeld on the other, and I adore them. They're just at the peak of their, at the peak of their style. You, you, mentioned, you mentioned Al Hirschfeld. I don't know if there's any connection, but when Robert Ripley went to get his second job as working on a newspaper, the head cartoonist in San Francisco was Harry Hirschfield. Oh, really? And, and, and Harry Hirschfield looked over, apparently nationally known, uh, and Harry Hirschfield, this would be 1908, Harry Hirschfield looked over his drawings, his portfolio, and told the sports editor, the kid's good, you ought to give him a chance. 
And, and that was what launched really the beginning of, of his major career was a recommendation from a Hirschfield. Now, I don't know if there's any connection to Al Hirschfield, but, but uh, 1908, Harry Hirschfield was a big name. Al Hirsch, I actually think it's Hirsch, it is Hirschfeld, like I was saying, saying yeah. Hirschfeld. Al Hirschfeld started his work in the 1920s. So he did caricatures of the Marx Brothers when they were young guys. And he continued drawing and getting published until uh, the late 90s. He died at the age of 99. And right up to the end, he was doing magnificent caricatures. Uh, I had the rare honor I, in my career, I got exactly two cartoons into the New Yorker, which is, was a thrill. But what was really a thrill was that on the one, it was one page, it had a cartoon by me on one side of it. You turned the page, and on the other side of my cartoon was an Al Hirschfield drawing of uh, Tom Wolf, the, the modern Tom Wolf, the, uh, the new journalist. Right. And that, that, made, that made me, it was like me and Al were a page apart. And uh, yeah, that was that was a great honor in itself. Great. Well, let's put out a call for any other questions that are coming in. I'll check the uh, listing up here for chats and see if other we've gone through some of the questions that you have talked about. And on the board at the moment, that's all. So if you do have a question, we're going to be signing off in just a short bit. So if you do have a question. Uh, put it on the chat and we will, we will bounce it around here in our world of Zoom. Let me also take this time to mention that we are in the process, of course, getting ready just two weeks from now to begin our 25th season of the Greenville Chautauqua, featuring the caricatures, featuring the characters that we have caricatured and talked about here. Our first performance is at two o'clock on June the 9th at the Simpsonville Arts Center with Mary Shelley. And that evening at 7.30 at the tent at Greenville Tech, uh, Robert Ripley. And of course, that's just the beginning of our 10 days of history coming alive. Um, do keep in mind that all of this information, the daytime shows, the indoor shows, the outdoor shows, at venues all over the upstate, that these are all available uh, for your perusal at historycomesalive.org. You can also find it at greenvillechautauqua.org, but nobody seems to be able to spell that. So let's look at historycomesalive.org and you can find us. Uh, I, I did know that you got a comment from somebody saying that their favorite drawing that you did this year was Steve Jobs. Oh, really? Well, I must have done something right. That's good. Uh, Larry, I wanted to say before you sign off, I want to give a shout out. I think she's in the audience to Sally Petoskey, who was the Petoskey, who was right? the director of this organization for a long, long time. We never met. Yes. But I loved working with her, and I just want to uh, give her a shout out and also thank the Chautauqua organization for letting me to continue, in spite of a change of leadership, that I can keep drawing these pictures for you, because I really do enjoy it every year. It's a, it's and, a and I'll mention not only Sally, but Sally's sister, Caroline, Caroline McIntyre, uh, the two of them were a guiding light for the last couple of decades on making sure everything got done, got in place, got presented as our program has grown and grown. And they were the ones who guided us towards having a permanent professional uh, in charge to make sure everything continues on, hopefully for decades to come here in the upstate of South Carolina. But I'm sure they appreciate your shout out. I would thank you to Caroline as well. Yes. I did not know uh, that. Somebody, uh, somebody has written in that they understand the Zoom will be available for two weeks to repeat, and they ask how did they access it. Um, so that like we share it with people who are away from Greenville, 
And the answer for that is actually pretty easy. Uh, we're going to send out an email to everyone who was registered for tonight's show with the address of uh, the YouTube uh, production. You can usually look at, uh, anyway, you can go to the Spartanburg County Libraries um, uh, web, uh, YouTube page and find it. It'll be posted in a few days, but when it becomes available, everyone who signed up to come to tonight's viewing will receive the directions and how to log into that so that you can share it with your friends and family and let people who haven't had a chance to see it, see it. Uh, in the weeks to come. And there's a comment here saying, thank you uh, so much for all your work. Your drawings add uniqueness to Greenville Chautauqua. And for that, I am forever grateful. And so um, I think you have a very appreciative audience here in Greenville. Thank you all very much. Really appreciate it. And with that, I think we're about ready to wrap everything up. Our thanks once again to the Spartanburg County Library, to uh, Charity uh, Rouse and to Kristen Bennett, who have made it possible for us to present our show for you this evening. I hope you learned something about our characters. I hope you learned something from behind the scenes of Greenville Chautauqua. And I hope you all come out and see all the shows and have a chance to, uh, to learn more about the real story that made this country the great place that it is. With that said, I thank you all and I wish everyone a good night.